and palpable. And one of those basic things is just taking the time to listen and respond to another person in your space. And sometimes that listening and responding doesn't even involve words. It's just being aware of the other people around you. So as we move forward today, I want to just call attention to the mission of this presentation. We want to focus on increasing the awareness that we have of our presence and also give us some tools to access the power of using story. You might have noticed at the beginning of this presentation, I started with a story, a personal story. Was it necessarily facts and data about what we're going to discuss today? Perhaps not, but it was a re perhaps a relatable for someone, um, simply because it was a childhood story, something, about, um, something I'm passionate about. It's an area of interest of mine that I was able to be vulnerable with. It's an opportunity to show who I am so that I can invite who you are to also come and be present with me in the room. That's the power of vulnerability. We want to help move our audiences in our presentations or in our classrooms from disengagement, where they look so engaged, <laughs> yeah. so interesting and miserable, all the way to engagement, where we look like a Hallmark commercial. <laughs> So in this presentation today, we're going to focus on two different areas, rediscovering our presence and then using storytelling to reach our audience. So there's going to be interactive moments today. If you would um, be willing to join by standing on your feet or speaking ne to somebody next to you, whenever you can do that, that would be really wonderful. But also please know that you, you are able to take care of your own self and whatever your needs are, I want you to be able to feel free to meet them. Okay, this is a cool quote by Albert Einstein. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten that gift. I think that in our 21st century, we are so inundated with technology and with information and data that sometimes we get lost in our data and move farther away from our core elemental human, human centers. So how do we develop our intuitive mind when our rational mind has been constantly taking more and more input of information? How do we de redevelop our intuitive mind that before we had access to so much data was valued greater? There's also this wonderful quote about how the world has plenty of people with lots of information, but what we need more of is people who have really come alive. So how do we find what it is that makes us really come alive and then go do that? The good news about presence is this. You already know everything you need to know to be an expert at being present. Because you've all been doing it if you started as one of these. <laughs> If you weren't one of these, uh, then you might be a robot, which could happen these days. But what I want to point out is that babies are experts at being present. Children are experts at being present. They'll tell you exactly what they want. He wanted the phone. He got it. They'll tell you what they want because there's no threshold of social impediments that they've learned to condition themselves to operate from. Instead, they operate from a place of truth telling. It's, a, it's, an, it's very important, it's an important skill that we've learned how to, how to process information and then respond in a way that is not just emotional. Um, but I am endeavoring to offer the idea that perhaps we've gotten so far away from responding authentically that we sometimes lose our, our humanity in the way we communicate. So here's the thing about, about the human mind. It's hardwired to be present. It's our social conditioning and our social impediments that have helped us develop these habits that get us away of, from our authentic behavior. The brain is formed beautifully, as you, many, some of you may be better experts than I am. I am more of a social and theatrical expert, <laughs> if you will. But some of you may know the mind and body connection is just fascinating. 
The mind and the body are interconnected. So whatever you're doing up here is being informed by your, by your body. So for example, where is your breath? when you are stressed or working on a project that elicits some sort of um, anxiety for you. Where do you find that breath is? Yes. It's a pie. It's a pie and it's fast. Absolutely. Does anybody else resonate with that? Yeah, me too. And it's a pie and it's fast. And what happens is then that sends our body into this, this uh, fight or flight response. It sends our body into this this um, awareness that something is wrong. When in actuality, our life is, something is not wrong. We're just dealing with something difficult or, or a tough deadline or something that we need to be able to process. And our brain is fully able to rationalize how we can best choose the way that we want to respond. But the problem is our body at its core is hardwired to protect us. So when we're breathing shallow up here, we're sending ourselves into um, a, a place where we can't actually access our rational thinking brain because it's being overtaken by our primordial brain. The other thing about this, I find I'm the most, most likely to be breathing from here when I feel like I'm juggling too many things at once. In the 21st century, we often are encouraged to, to have this cycle of perpetual balancing acts. But this multitasking idea is actually, it's actually ineffective. Studies show that, that multitasking, when we're doing two things at once, we're actually 40% less effective at the one thing that we were doing in the first place. Who has time to be 40% less effective at what they're doing? Not me. This is science meeting ancient wisdom. It's not woo-woo. It's just about getting back to what you already know. You're already experts at being present because you did it when you were a child. You're already fully developed as, as adults in your, in your rational thinking. So how do you just access your ability to be conscious to make decisions versus having to make them from a, an emotional place? This is a great... Um, a great teacher, Sarah Harvey Yao. I've loved some of her books, Get Present, um, and also Drop In. She talks about the ability to just drop in to your body and into the present moment before you do a talk, before you answer a question, any of that. So, as I said, how do we move from that emotional reactivity, that shortness of breath, that tightness, our shoulders getting hunched? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, do you know that when you have to go to the bathroom, your heart rate actually raises? And I know sometimes when I feel stressed and overwhelmed, I will, my breath is short, and I don't think I have time to eat, and I don't think I have time to even take care of my, myself in that way, because I gotta get my work done. When in effect, my heart rate is going up, I'm becoming less and less productive and less effective. 40% as statistics show. So how do we just give ourselves the awareness to really take in our surroundings so that we can move to our rational and higher thinking brain? There's a phenomenal acting technique called Viewpoints by Anne Bogart. And I was very skeptical of it at first when I was going to college auditions because it felt very woo-woo. It was a bunch of people in a room moving around at odd positions quacking and doing strange things. And I couldn't understand what was going on. But it turns out, the idea is, we're so accustomed to moving in our pedestrian style that we lose the ability to think creatively about how else our body can function. So this idea behind viewpoints is an opportunity to just be more aware of our surroundings. So in lieu of moving around today and quacking and stomping and doing lots of crazy things since you just ate. What I want to do is just invite you for one of the aspects of viewpoints um, to engage one of those aspects. And the, the first one of that is architecture. So this just says, okay, take stock of the architecture in the room. Meaning, what are the things around me? How does the table feel? What does it feel like to have my feet on the floor? How does my body feel in this chair? So as I'm speaking through these, will you just kind of Follow along with me and just take note. How does the table feel? How do your clothes feel in your hand? 
What are some smells you're identifying with? taste in your mouth? Dessert. Dessert? <laughs> yes, exactly. He found a need. <laughs> what else are you finding? Um, how, does your, how does your body feel in the chair? What's your body position like? Where's their tension? So architecture, getting involved with the space. Is there something in the space that you may have, that I'm going to just not talk for about 10 seconds. And as you, can you just explore with the architecture? You can just do it around your chair if you'd like. You might even pick up your chair if you wanted to stand up. You might just look around at different things. You might feel different things. And after 10 seconds, I'll ask if there's something in the room that you noticed that you didn't notice before. the walls had panels and the roof had tiles, which I didn't notice before. All the different shapes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Do you also sense the way that there's kind of a, an air of, the, the breath in the room feels a little bit different now than it did before those 10 seconds? Can anyone else feel that? We'll work on how we feel it today, but if you can feel that now, will you um, wave at me? You can feel the breath being a little different in the room? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe one person. <laughs> That's okay. That's why this is a whole, you know, lifelong of study and work. So, so what I want to invite you to, to do is, is think about, ah, I want you to feel what I'm feeling. I want you to feel it. So let me just introduce a few ways that are very practical in your day-to-day -day life that you could use to help yourself feel that sense of presence. Getting up and walking at work, practicing gratitude. So this is taking a moment to just um, remember what you're thankful for. Remember what you feel gratitude about. It could be the sunrise that you see coming through the window. It could be somebody's laugh in the other room. It's a, it's a slight pause of gratitude. It's amazing how that actually alters the chemistry in our brain and allows our body to relax and better listen and receive. Another way is making eye contact. Simply making eye contact with another human. Like, like I mentioned at the beginning, we're hardwired for connection as, as human beings. We spend most of our days looking at laptops for some of us, but actually the thing that fuels our spirit is humans, is interaction with other humans. And so you don't always have to talk to people to enjoy that, that interaction. Just eye contact can have that same, can have a bit of that effect. Another way is deep breathing. You know, there's a lot of talk about meditation and emptying your mind. And can I just say, I think give it up. Like our minds are always working. So I don't think the goal is to empty our minds of thought. I think it's to allow our minds to process thoughts and let them come and go without needing to try to control them all at all times. So deep breathing can allow you to just access, actually allow your brain to function the way it's designed to function. Another thing is paying attention to your gut's response. Okay, gut, However, how else might you define that? Your impulse. Remember this gentleman realized when he took a deep breath that he wanted a dessert. He smelled it, he found his impulse, he found it, um, and followed it. Things like that. If before you raise your hand, you might have an impulse that you're, that you're ready to share, that you'd like to share. <clears throat> Finding what are my impulses and what, what is my gut response and being okay with that. Being, allowing yourself to actually feel the emotion that you feel. When I was in college, my acting professor, Richard Gang, 
Oh, he was so mean. And he, would, he was so mean that he didn't even like when people would use niceties or say, hi, how's it going today? Or how are you today? Because he felt like it was, wasn't saying the truth. <laughs> it was just saying a saying. And he was so after human connection, he'd say, what is the point of that wasted talk? Better to just recognize another human being by looking them in the eyes, because at least that's honest. <laughs> I recognize that you're here, and that's enough. He was, he, but one of the things that I really liked about what he talked about was the, the opportunity to say yes to my own feelings and be okay with them, rather than, oh, like that same person that walks in every day at the office and I don't like how loud they are or how loud their shoes are, whatever it is, is that emotional response. It's in like, oh, but I'm not allowed to feel that. I'm not allowed to feel that. And we do so much of that that we eventually can't feel what we're feeling. So we're, we're just walking around like uh, with like, hi, this is my stuff. I've got this stuff and I've got this stuff and this is who I am. But I'm really clamored with a bunch of stuff on me instead of unadulterated, authentic, authentic self. It's like piling up, piling up walls of how we respond because of our social impediments. So that's what he was after. Just getting it in touch with how do I really feel and, and being okay with really feeling that. And then you can choose how you respond, of course. So maybe you decide that you don't like that that person wears those shoes every day that they walk in, but it's, it's not going to affect your emotional state. I want to be unmessable with. I want to be able to walk in, in into any room and through every day and be unmessable with. How do you find that as a leader? Because most of us are leaders in some sort of capacity. We're educators, we're researchers, we're leading projects, we're leading teams. How do you find that inner confidence, that stability that grounds you? And a lot of it is this work of being present. Simple, everyday ways you can practice it. The other thing is, like we talked about, just taking care of your body. Being, you know, putting yourself before your work. So before we move into this next section, I just want to take a moment to also take a note of a social contract. So in the room today, I thank you that you've been answering questions, you've been speaking out, um, you took time to connect with other people around you. Thank you for doing that. We're going to continue to do that in this afternoon, or as, as we're continuing. And I want you to just I want to invite you to participate to your best ability, but take care of yourself, to push past resistance. Um, there's this, I, I studied at the Landmark Forum um, for a bit, it's, there's lots of controversy around it, but 